All right, we're recording. So I want to introduce Jay and Ashish from uh, LBL's uh, security division. And they're going to be talking a little bit about uh, their experiences and their practice with uh, 100 gig security monitoring uh, on the campus of uh, LBL. So uh, I don't know who's going to start, Jay or Ashish, but I'll turn it over to you guys. And uh, uh, if there's any questions that people have, just type them in chat and I'll make sure that they get relayed. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I'll, I'll start us off and then Ashish will take it over when it gets uh, technically interesting. Um, so I'm Jay Krause, uh, also on the phone, uh, I think as mentioned, is Ashish Sharma. And then Vince Stouffer is our partner in crime in this project, and he's not on this call. He has joined Core Light, not with Berkeley Lab, but I just want to make sure he was a big part of this project, so I just want to make sure he gets some credit here, too. Um, so what our agenda is, or what we're going to talk about, is uh, give you some background. What is LBL? Uh, what, is, what is our solution overview, what did we build and why, uh, different components to it. Uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to Ashish to talk about uh, Bro, how we implemented shunting with Bro, talk about some of the performance tuning, sort of the current state of our monitoring solution, how it's working, and then we'll you know, take any questions at the end. <clears throat> so I want to just start here with a little background on you know, what is Berkeley Lab, why do we sort of have this uh, unique solution? Why do we have to come up with this solution? So Berkeley Lab is more like a uh, academic institute than it is a government facility. We are run by University of California, uh, thousands of employees. There's no classified work. It's all open science work. We have a very open network. Um, you know, almost all of our computers are accessible from the internet. Uh, we don't have a firewall. We have uh, thousands of visitors that come in every day with sort of unknown configured systems. So it makes a large part of our, the way that we do cybersecurity is by monitoring, by having visibility, having insight into what's going on with our network. <clears throat> uh, the other thing that uh, is unique about Berkeley Lab is we have what we call these user facilities. So we have large scientific instruments. These instruments are unique to the world where people come from all over the place to do big data, to generate big data, to do big science on these pieces of equipment. Uh, some of them are the Advanced Light Source, uh, the JGI, the Molecular Foundry. <clears throat> What's done is the science is done on these pieces of equipment, and then commonly they want to transfer out the data uh, via ESnet to a supercomputer to do analysis on that. So that has created a situation where uh, there's a lot of pressure on our network to continue to upgrade it to support uh, you know, big data, big science, and transferring this data from us, the source of the data, the source of the science, to some place like NERSC or other supercomputer centers where the, the, the data gets analyzed. So the, the problem this creates for us, and it sort of ties into ESnet and ESnet vision, is that, we, you know, we don't have to make the supercomputer centers at the same location where the science is done. That We want science to be unconstrained by where the science is happening versus where the supercomputers are. Uh, this is an ESnet graph that some people on the call may have seen before, but it sort of shows it shows this happening. My, my graph's a little dated, but you're starting to see the growth, uh, uh, you know, of network bandwidth utilization due to these large scientific data movements. Particularly at the lab, there's some uh, experiments at the LS that are taking you know large amounts of uh, uh, pictures of proteins, you know, multiple times uh, per second, generating massive amounts of data. So this creates a situation where um, we needed to upgrade our network. We started to have pressure on our network at 10 gig. There was, you know, we were reaching spikes of two, three gig, and we were hearing from scientists that they want to go faster, that, you know, they uh, were buying into the science DMZ model. People were setting up data transfer nodes. They were sort of prepping for this environment where they could, they could move data faster, uh, you know, or up to 10 gig or over 10 gig. Um, so a little background on what do we look like at this point is um, the core pieces of technology that Ashish and I are going to get into are, you know, this, this talk is really about these two pieces of technology is Bro. Uh, we've been running Bro, uh, the Bro Intrusion Detection System for a long time. It was developed at Berkeley Lab. We still have Bro logs since 1994 spinning on disk right now. Um, the other thing is we've had 10 gig monitoring with Bro for a long time as well. So we moved to 10 gig about 2007. Um, so the, the, the concepts that I'm talking about, tapping, aggregation, and bro, we've been doing for a long time, but we've been doing them on a flat network, and it's been pretty simple. You know, it's pretty easy to take a tuple of 10 gig links, 
feed them into a bro box and get you know some uh, a visibility into your network. And then what we do with that and sort of the core things that bro does for us is it looks at that traffic and it looks for hostile activity in that traffic and then blocks people in real time. That's what's described here is we have a dynamic firewall. So bro examines traffic. So rather than you know having a conventional firewall and predefining what's good and bad and what we want to allow ahead of time, that's just, it's not practical in our environment where we have, you know, affiliates all over the world doing all sorts of new things every day. We can't predefine that. So what Bro does is it looks for this hostile activity um, and then in, implements a null route into the border. That's the dynamic firewall portion of this when it sees hostile activity. That's, that's the core piece of our protection. That's what we need to maintain. That's the problem is maintaining that as we move to 100 gig. How are we going to continue to do cybersecurity in that way as we move forward to 100 gig? Um, the existing TAP infrastructure was commodity stuff, AppCon, CPACket infrastructure. Here's what it looked like in the 10 gig age, right? So we would have uh, on the left is AppCon. We upgraded that to CPackets. The idea here was that you take, you, you know, you can see on the top is our, uh, you know, is our DMZ. I don't know if this actually highlights here. I don't think I can draw on this. So at the top of that, you'll see we bring in our DMZ and then we output it to lots of different bro boxes. These bro boxes do different things. Um, at the bottom is an example of what a, a bro box might look like. This is, um, a, again, technology we're not gonna get a lot into today, but important background for what we're gonna get into today is that uh, bro has natively built into it the ability to cluster, meaning that uh, all of the 1U computers you see here are working together to analyze 10 gigs of traffic where, you know, a part of the traffic goes to each one of those boxes. This was developed long ago as well, but th this, is what, this is what it looked like pre-100 gig. Um, a little bit more about bro clustering. So uh, native in bro, it scares horizontally. People have built very large bro clusters. Uh, the logs get centralized, so the bro logs go to a manager, the config is centralized, so it's um, another talk to get deep into bro clustering, but it's, I think it's background for what we're gonna get into next. So what was decided in 2014 is that we wanted to upgrade our network border, not because we had pressure on 10 gig, but we saw that pressure coming as we were hearing about future science experiments, as people were building DTNs, as we were seeing spikes in the network traffic, and we really wanted to build and design towards this science DMZ model. That is that we built a path in our network that has, uh, you know, 10 gig links with large buffers specifically designed to move data transfer modes, uh, data transfer nodes to that area of the network to allow them to go, you know, full line speed 10 gig. The other thing that was going to happen in this upgrade is that we we're going to have redundant border routers. At the point in time here, we had a single border router. We wanted to have two border routers. I mean, uh, multiple 100 gig links and then multiple 10 gig backup links. So um, I think this was great for the networking community, great for the scientific community, but I think for, for us in cybersecurity, we're going, oh boy, this is, this is going to get much more complicated than that would, what we've been doing in the past, right? We've got multiple places to tap. The links are faster. Uh, our networking group was talking about all internal routers will be dual linked to the external router. So we've sort of had this picture drawn for us of what the future, future architecture is going to look like. So what we had to do with that is we, you know, we were essentially told by our CIO, figure out how to monitor that. There was, there was nothing existed to monitor 100 gig. Um, you couldn't go out. I mean, I think this has gotten a little better now. Like there's some vendors that, you know, say they have a 100 gig monitor solution. But when we were looking at this in 2014, there was, there was nothing in this space. In fact, it was still even difficult to find any sort of monitoring equipment or tapping equipment that had a 100 gig interface. And the stuff that we did find, the 100 gig interfaces were super expensive. This, I think this is still L4 only interface time. You know, they were like 70K each. So as soon as we wanted to tap 400 gig links, or sorry, 200 gig links each direction, we were immediately up to 280K and we hadn't done anything but bought interfaces. Um, and then the other challenge, just the ability to scale this up, that we were going to be looking at, you know, uh, traffic in excess of 10 gig and we had not built a bro cluster that we you know could, could scale that uh, that far yet so that that was our challenge um, so the first thing I think we identified that the critical piece that we needed here is we needed a new device so specifically we needed a new device to do the tap aggregation um, the tapping itself ended up to be trivial um, we we used at the time and we still use now net optics just has you know these totally passive optical taps 
um, uh, you know, those are a couple hundred dollars. You put them in line, and then you have you know a a, a view into the network traffic that our networking group likes because they're totally passive. The problem was where to send that. So if we put those taps in place, where do we send that 100 gig traffic? Where do we send that 10 gig traffic? Um, so we needed a device for that. We knew on the device that we wanted to have um, various different sorts of filtering. We had already been done uh, doing filtering in the past um, for things like, you know, uh, uh, you know, some of these tapping points see internal to er internal traffic. And we don't want to see internal to internal traffic, so we want to filter that out at the tap aggregation device. Um, we, we knew that, we had, that this device had to do aggregation, that we needed to bring you know, multiple 10 gig, multiple 100 gig links all together into a single stream that we could then monitor. So that was one of the requirements. We didn't want to have to worry about oversubscription. You know, we wanted 100 gig and 10 gig to really mean full line speed, 100 gig, 10 gig. And then this wasn't really a requirement, um, um, so it's a little mischaracterized here, but one of the things that was interesting, and I'm uh, getting a little ahead of myself, but there's a concept of an API where you could not only have uh, this ability to do filtering, but there would be an API so that you could do that filtering just with an API command, and you could tie that together in interesting things, and that's sort of the, the preview for shunting, which we'll get a, a lot more detail into shunting in a few minutes. <clears throat> Um, so we built a list of what, uh, you know, we didn't know if any of this existed, but we built a list of what our requirements were. What are all the things that this device that we wasn't even, you know, we weren't sure if it existed yet, but what are the requirements of this device? We wanted to have full filter capering abilities. I don't think we knew exactly what we wanted to filter for, but we didn't want to be limited by that. Um, the C packet had some limitations where you can only do filtering on input ports, but not output ports. That became a requirement because that created some consternation for us with C packet. We knew we needed the ability to create port groups. Uh, I mean, a lot of this is a little bit in the weeds. Maybe the last one on here is we just want to make sure that IPv6 support as well. Our, our C packet infrastructure didn't have IPv6 support. So our first step was to build this list of requirements. Um, and then we, we started to sort of see and have a vision of what our approach would look like. So our approach was um, to just scale up our bro cluster. So we had a bro cluster that did 10 gig. We had heard of other places that have scaled bro clusters past 10 gig. So the idea was just add more nodes to a cluster, much like is done in HPC spaces, just make that a bigger cluster. We had a 10 node cluster, so we'll make it a 20 node cluster, a 50 node cluster. We, we believe we could just keep scaling that. And as evidence of that, we had you know, other people's large clusters. Um, so the, the second piece to the approach is what I just talked about, is we, needed, we know we needed some type of you know, new, more sophisticated device to do um, advanced aggregation, uh, duplication, um, you know, of the links to ensure that all the links were aggregated together, were duplicated out to multiple external cores. We knew it had needed to have 100 gig um, uh, interfaces. And the other thing is, I mean, we, we were sort of standing on the shoulders of Scott Campbell and some work that NERSC had done. So NERSC had um, uh, done what I would call a, a, you know, an early beta implementation of something like this. So we knew that you know, there was something was possible here. Uh, I think, uh, so our goal was to build uh, you know, a production version of sort of the, uh, what Scott had laid out and sort of the new pieces that we saw coming into the environment. Um, so now let's, so let's, so we begin to dig in, right? So this is, this is the, the sort of the meat of the presentation and these are the things we're gonna dig deep into is the overview of the solution. So the new components, we need to do traffic distribution. So that is, you know, the tap aggregation distribution. The other thing we begin to realize, and we're sk skipping some background here for the sake of time, is that Bro natively is only single threaded. So, uh, and we have these uh, boxes that have uh, many CPUs in them. So the other thing we realized, and there'd been some work in this space, is that we needed to do some distribution within the host. Um, so that is that we're going to send one nth of the traffic to the host, but we realized that we needed to break that traffic up again on the host to be able to uh, run multiple different bro processes to send uh, just a piece of that traffic to each bro process. And uh, that, that sounds confusing as I say, but I'll, we'll get into that more in just a minute. Uh, and then again, scale up bro, and then this shunting piece, which we'll get into. So that is, uh, you know, the ability to use the, uh, the API of a device to sort of control the traffic flow and what we're monitoring. Okay, so traffic distribution. So um, as we begin to survey in the environment, we begin to talk to different um, uh, vendors about what they had in the 100 gig space. 
I would say we, we identified that there were sort of three different options to go in this direction. The first option was there are vendors that specifically focus on TAC aggregation devices. Um, Indace was one of them. Um, you know, CPacket was one of them, where all they do is they build devices and they sell to people that are trying to do TAC aggregation. We already knew the downside with these is they're expensive. You know, they're, you, you know, they want lots of money for these sort of TAC aggregation devices. Something that was more attractive and that we started to see people do, this is one of the things that Scott did at NERSC, is to use commodity networking equipment um, to do TAP aggregation. So that is to take a Cisco, take an Arista, take a Brocade, um, and sort of configured in such a way that it's not doing conventional routing or switching. It's doing, you know, special aggregation and distribution like one would want to do for NetSecurity. So that was another class that we were looking at. The third class we were looking at is layering some sort of software-defined network, flow scale, side pass, something like that, on top of commodity networking, right? So sort of going a, a non-proprietary, uh, you know, a packet distribution route for a commodity networking device. So we, st we, we started to look at those. So this was, the, this was the people we looked at in what I would call the, you know, the, the tap vendor space. Um, uh, Gigamon is certainly in this space, very expensive. I'm not going to go through this, the, these charts in excruciating detail. I'm just going to high level look at them. Um, CPacket, which was already a vendor that we had, um, and then Indace. So we reached out, we talked to all these vendors. You know, the first question was, do you have something with a 100 gig interface? That quickly, at this point in time, CPacket didn't have anything. So that filtered them out. Gigamon had something with 100 gig, um, but it was clear out the gate that we couldn't afford that. Um, Indace had something with a 100 gig interface, and we said, okay, sure, ship us one of those. I think literally they shipped us the first one they ever had, right? It, it, I think we may have had the first Indace box with 100 gig interface. So they shipped us two of those things. We looked at them, we evaluated them, they um, had some limitations I'm not going to get into now because we, we didn't end up selecting them, but uh, uh, they were still very expensive, you know, so it was multiple hundreds of thousand dollars for each one of these very customized devices to do traffic distribution. Um, so then we moved on. So we moved on to the next category is sort of um, conventional, you know, routing switching vendors, Arista, Brocade, Cisco, begin to work with them and talk to them and say, what do you have with a 100 gig interface? Um, Arista, all of these vendors had something with a 100 gig interface. Uh, we started to compare it against our requirements. Um, you know, what are the pros, cons? Um, can they support what we're trying to do? We, we brought in um, a Brocade and Arista. So here is, this is a point in time where we had Brocade's offering here. Um, you can see the 200 gig interfaces. We fed the traffic into it. We played around with, you know, what are the capabilities of distribution? We brought the Arista devices in. We played around with these. Um, uh, in the end, to make short, long story short here, is we ended up choosing Arista. Um, and it's sort of, here's the high-level view of why we chose Arista. Is, uh, and it, it, it starts to get into this API. So Arista had a, at this point in time, they had a, it was a relatively new software stack that they called DANS or DONS. I don't remember what that acronym is now. But it was a software stack specifically designed towards the sorts of things we were trying to do. It was designed for doing tap aggregation, distribution, um, had an API, had the ability to do, uh, you know, uh, uh, distribution based upon things like source IP address, destination IP address. It was clear that they were, they were interested in us as a customer and us as a, uh, uh, you know, a market, right? They, this was designed and looked exactly like the sort of things we were looking for. Uh, we found Arista to be really low cost, so where some of the other solutions were really expensive, really customized. Uh, and then as we looked around, we, we noticed that there were other people that were using Arista, not, maybe not necessarily for 100 gig, but it, it, it was clear that we were not the first to think Arista could do interesting tap aggregation things. Uh, and then they had a lot of flexibility in what they could do, right? This, this dance protocol had a GUI on it. You could do sort of really interesting uh, glue technology things. So let me start to outline what the technology stack looks like. Um, so one of the first thing that is a little weird here is when we first heard about Dance from Arista, it actually wasn't available on their device that had 100 gig interfaces. So you end up with this uh, sort of odd configuration, but I'll explain why we like this configuration. Then you end up this configuration where we ended up purchasing an Arista 7504 because that's where the 100 gig interfaces were. So that's what you see at the top. 
ESnet 100 gig uh, transmit goes into one, receive goes into the other, and then these at the time were our, our, our backup link. So we have a backup link to ESnet, CNIC, and then two to UC Berkeley. The idea is to aggregate and jam all of that traffic together, um, but then the ability to distribute that traffic, how we want to distribute it with DONTS was not at that time available on the 7504 model. That's sort of how, how new that capability was. So what we had to do is the, the DONTS capability was only available on the Arista 7150. So we had to have an Arista 7150 to get the, the traffic distribution software we wanted. So this is just a, a straightforward lag group from the 7504 to the 7150 um, for no other reason but to move all of the traffic and aggregate to a device that has the feature set that we wanted. Um, the second piece of the solution here is using the DONTS software. So as I mentioned, the DONTS software has this capability that uh, uh, they call symmetric hashing, where what it can do is uh, Bro wants to see all of the traffic for a particular session. Uh, the, right, the reality that the, the Bro cluster works is uh, you know, each bro expects to seize all the sessions, it rolls up the session and it reports it to the manager. You sort of can't have different bits of a session going to different bros. That's just sort of not how, you know, not how a bro cluster works, but Dont solves that perfectly by creating a hash. They have various different ways you can do this hash. Uh, uh, the, the, the way that we chose it is it hashed on source, destination, IP, port, and protocol, and then ensures that that goes to an individual bro node. That's the secret of Don. So now we take, now you can begin to see how we're distributing the traffic to different bro nodes. So uh, it all comes in the 7150 and then, you know, approximately one fifth, there's, there's more detail here and there's actually papers written on, you know, ensuring that this is uh, done in the correct manner. But it ensures that you get approximately one fifth of the traffic to each one of those bro nodes. So the solution here is to, uh, is, is you can't monitor large volumes of, traffic with a single bro instance on a single bro node, so you split up the problem. This is the, the first stage of splitting up the problem, is split up, you know, one-fifth in our case, but really one-nth of the traffic to each bro node. So the next, the next part of the solution is that, you know, each bro node is getting one-fifth of the traffic, so it's possible here that each bro node is getting 20 gig. That's still too much for an individual bro process. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to distribute the traffic again at the host level. Um, so how we chose to do that, and again, there's there's more we could say here. There's various different network card offerings here. Intel cards do this. Miracoms do it. There's uh, many cards do this at this point. What we chose in this time was the Miracom card. So Miracom uh, has a driver called uh, Sniffer 10 gig. It it or I'm sorry, that's the uh, um, the name of the software stack. Uh, it works on Linux, works on FreeBSD. That was an important characteristic for us. We're a FreeBSD shop, so I think a card that had good drivers for FreeBSD sort of swayed us in this direction. Um, what the Miracom card has the ability to do, and Ashish will get into this in more detail, but it has the ability to split the traffic again. So you may have uh, you know, 10 gig, 20 gig coming into this individual card, but then the card can create uh, additional virtual interfaces, again, which have one nth of the traffic coming into it. Um, so here's what that looks like, is each server has one Miragom card. Then what we do is we run 10 bro processes on this bro host. Each of those get one tenth of the traffic. So again, we, we break it up again, and then we, we pin each of those bro processes to um, a, a piece of traffic, and then we can add servers to scale. So. Uh, in a sort of cartoonish picture, here's the idea, and then I'll bring back that diagram, is you've got this problem of 100 gig of traffic. You break it up into, you know, evenly distributed 10 gig chunks. You break those 10 gig chunks up into lots of little 1 gig chunks, and then that's what you feed to an individual bro process. And then the bro clustering software already knows how to take, you know, 50, 100 individual bro processes and roll them back together, roll all the logs together. And then here's what it looks like in diagram mode is, um, you know, the blue come out. The blue is one-fifth of the traffic. That goes into a Miracom card. The Miracom card breaks that up into 10 virtual interfaces. And then a bro, 10 bro processes each monitor one of those bro interfaces. So in summary here is, you know, each bro instance is really only seeing one-fiftieth of the traffic here. Uh, the... the 
the bigger goal of this project wasn't really to build a 100 gig uh, Arista Miracom Bro IDS. Our real goal here was just to sort of lay out and explain an architecture or an approach that one could have to monitoring 100 gig. So just as important as our specific solution of Arista Miracom Bro on FreeBSD is that you could do this in many other ways with sort of this, um, you know, this architectural approach where the approach is pick whatever you want to do the load balancing. Um, I, I think all of these vendors are uh, capable of doing this at this point. Um, split the traffic at the node. Several technologies can do that at this point. Many people are doing Linux PF ring, packet bricks, end days. Uh, that split up traffic, then run it through intrusion detection system. Snort and Suricata are fine intrusion detection systems. You could do this all on Linux. So our, our, our main goal here was to outline an, an architecture and an approach and then show, you know, uh, our solution is a specific implementation of this approach of dividing, dividing the traffic, to, you know, so you get it down to manageable portions to a single, you know, intrusion detection system process. Okay, so that it, at that point, so I'm going to turn this over to Ashish a little since Ashish is the bro expert and he's the one that actually runs this cluster and sort of understands the uh, components behind the scenes. Um, Ashish, I can either just flip through slides for you or you could share your screen so you can flip through slides at your own leisure. So I, I can just uh, request the remote control. Okay. You got so, it. So while you guys are switching over, there was a question that came in, and it's probably good to answer it now before you move on. Uh, this is yeah. from Tony Tony Brock. Is the Miracom card breaking the data out in a similar symmetric hash to the Arista, or are the bro processes on the appliances uh, able to handle the session traffic being spread across the various processes? No, that's an excellent question. So the, the Miracom card does the exact same sort of symmetric hashing as the Arista does. It may, in fact, be the exact same algorithm hashing on, you know, destination IP, source IP, the exact sort of thing is, is done again at Miracom that was done um, with Arista. That's a good question. <coughs> uh, thanks, Jay. So uh, uh, I added these two slides actually because I was not sure if audience is actually even familiar with Bro or uh, uh, I think oh, sorry, Ashish, I did the wrong thing there. So, screen share. And then uh, hand over the control. Or I can do my own screen share otherwise. Yeah, so. Okay, there, I think you're good now? Yeah. So I added, I'm not sure if audience is actually familiar with Bro or have used Bro or not. But uh, uh, go to www.bro.org. There is plenty of documentation and there is a mailing list. Uh, there is a dedicated IRC channel on Freenode. And you can always uh, send an email to security at lbl.gov or me. Uh, and uh, we'll be happy to talk about Bro or help you with stuff there. So, but uh, uh, the high level overview of Bro. Do you not, maybe you don't have control again. So, how about I just do my screen share? I think that would help. Okay, that might be better. That way I can't mess you up. So, uh, can you disable your J? I think I did. Sure. Everybody can see this, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so here is uh, basically how Bro looks like. So Bro has uh, is more than just uh, uh, like uh, network monitor in sense that Bro can do a lot of other capabilities to it. Actually. Uh, it's like a network flight recorder with actually a scripting engine and then uh, you can have your own custom logic and heuristics. But 
uh, the way we, like a high level overview is that the network traffic comes in bro does packet processing by that this actually it means that uh, the tcp uh, 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 stream reassembly is done by the bro and that is one of the reasons for uh, like doing symmetric hashing both on arista as well as on mericom cards because when you have a tcp session unless bro actually sees the entire session it does cannot make sense out of what's going on in that particular session so we need symmetric hashing that way a session gets preserved all the way to bro nodes uh, and then uh, bro can know that this particular tcp session can be an http session or an smtp or irc or any of these different protocols which it is monitoring and then uh, ashish just and, one one thing to stop you on quickly we're only <laughs> seeing uh, the white part of your screen if you're trying to show a uh, specific window uh, oh okay so uh, okay we can see your uh, github instance right now github instance oh okay stop share share screen Okay, can you see the slide deck yeah. now? Yeah, there we go. Now we're good. Okay, yeah, thanks for pointing it out. Otherwise, I would have kept talking and talking. So, uh, okay, so this diagram actually shows this. There is a network traffic. So basically, the traffic in the tab feeds to bro. Packet processing happens. This is where all the TCP assembly of the uh, streams are happening. Then there's a programming language. Bro comes with its own policies. But then on the top of it, you can do all kinds of different heuristics. Uh, so that that's pretty high level idea of bro but i wanted to just inject this thing uh, so now in our monitoring system uh, we actually wanted uh, the architecture we, where we can do this divide and conquer on the traffic we wanted to split all the traffic to different workers and then each worker actually sees about 150th of the tra total volume and uh, for uh, I, I think there is no uh, more logic here then uh, just share uh, instincts and experience where we said, okay, let's start with 50 worker cluster. So on our 10 gig clusters, we were running 10 workers. So we said, okay, 100 gig cluster, just run 50 workers and let's see how that works out. So, and then we also monitored the traffic and we were seeing like sustained 20 GBPS and there were little spikes there. So we said, okay, each worker can handle about 400 Mbps, so let's go with it. In case we need more than that, we can actually keep adding more workers to it. So that was the initial idea and uh, when we were actually uh, going for the procurement for physical hardware. So the way uh, this particular cluster got set up is that there was one manager and this manager's primary job was basically to collect all the logs and then write to the desk. But then it also was controlling all the different workers. Then there is a concept of proxy in Bro, which actually uh, facilitates communication between all the workers. So the idea there is that, let's say, for example, scan detection. Uh, you know, each worker might see only a part of this big scan going on. So proxies actually make sure that this state gets shared between all the workers and the manager. And then we said, okay, let's have 50 worker nodes. So the idea was like five streams of 10 gigs go to each physical box and then it gets broken down and then each uh, worker actually sees only a subset of that particular traffic. So now the major component in this entire architecture was shunting. So uh, uh, shunting actually like there is plenty of uh, work done by Scott and then there is a lot of uh, uh, research literature available as well. So the idea was to take advantage of heavy tail effect. Uh, for example, uh, uh, when we do grid FTP transfer or when we do big SSH transfer, the, uh, the deal is that uh, they can be multiple gigabytes, terabytes, but that is only a subset of the traffic for entire uh, network. Uh, so, but the, I, the deal here is that all the HTTP traffic together, which is like, uh, ninety nine percent of all the connections only consume like one percent of the bytes, and these one percent of the big SSH connections consume ninety nine percent of the bytes. So these are the this ninety nine percent of the byte is actually heavy tail effect. So if we only see uh, like first like five hundred megabytes of this two terabyte transfer, then we basically eliminate rest of the two terabytes literally. 
and bro does not get overwhelmed with analyzing the traffic which is uninteresting and uh, actually uh, doesn't make sense to bro so so that sh what shunting does is that it actually identifies the traffic which is interesting or uninteresting and then it cuts off uh, uninteresting traffic's path to bro so bro does not see anything uh, uh, which it it's not uh, wanting to see so a simple identify big elephant flows uh, only allow the control traffic from those and by control traffic i mean that uh, send all the initial connection session and establishment packets so basically all the sins and acts uh, but then when it comes down to the data bytes just shun that traffic don't send anything but then when the connection is ending like if you see a fan if you see a reset then send all those bytes again to the bro cluster so and then the exclusion was done on the ip pairs and the net blocks and then ports in the protocol and there is plenty of uh, 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 work related uh, which actually did the study and then we figured out that you know uh, we can prioritize the shunting to these research networks and affiliates and without much risk to the system so let's say the traffic going to nurse or traffic going to other national labs we know is mostly reliable and we can actually safely shunt that uh, at a greater level of assurance so uh, but what we wanted was actually these capabilities we wanted it to be dynamic uh, and it, we wanted it to be via bro so we did not want any other monitor or architecture because that would actually make uh, bro go crazy because it won't know what state is happening like all of a sudden the traffic is come, going away is it actually is the system dropping it or is it actually uh, 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 like what exactly is going on but when bro carries on the shunting bro knows that I have shunted this connection if I am missing the bytes I know the reason is because I shunted it it has to be near real time and by that I mean like if, if we can do it in microseconds awesome at least milliseconds seconds are not good enough so and the reason is like for example perf sonar goes from 0 to 10 GB within milliseconds so you have to have shunting go very fast it has to be api otherwise real time doesn't work very well and if we can do this this is holy grail of 10 gig monitoring so uh, here are some examples for shunting so bros dynamically determines protocol so when the bytes are on the wire bro knows that this is http this is ssh this is smtp this is grid ftp so the logic says, okay, watch everything in these protocols up to 128 megabytes. But by after 128 megabytes are transferred, then kick in a shunting script, talk to Arista, say, okay, this particular IP and the source port, uh, destination port and destination IP combination with the protocol, we don't want to see anymore. So don't send this traffic to bro anymore. And likewise, we actually said uh, for grid FTP Globus, we just decided two megabytes is sufficient enough. We can identify it quickly. Let's just do it. Uh, with HTTP and SSH, uh, we chose 128 megabytes because we did, did not want uh, to just block at 500 kilobytes or two megabytes in case if it's actually bad uh, connection or there is something wacky going on here. So let's know a little bit more, but 128 seemed to be a reasonable uh, thing the 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 it, uh, grid FTP also was harder because there is like multiple streams. Grid FTP quickly changes ports, so there are ten thousand ports allocated to it. So uh, when grid FTP starts, the idea is like okay, data has to go really fast. So if you wait for one hundred twenty eight megabytes per connection, there would be a lot of connections already uh, 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 created, and then there would, there would be a lot of bytes already going to grow. So that's why. I, the idea was to have a smaller threshold there too. So there is another concept which actually comes in and it's called Dumno. So Dumno was actually a Python program for shunting and Dumno is the interface which actually talks between Bro and Arista. It's written by Justin Azov from NCSA. And uh, uh, what it does is that it uses Arista's JSON API uh, to add ACLs on Arista. And uh, these ACLs only allow control packets then. And then Dumno also has part of like Bro's reaction framework, uh, which actually uh, like looks at all the traffic, uh, Bro calls this reaction framework, which actually calls Dumno, and then it fires an ACL. 
Now, the good part in this entire setup is that the connection details are preserved. So, uh, Bro actually has a, something called a connection log. It's literally like a NetFlow uh, in Bro world. So, what it does is when connection ends, uh, Bro would actually put a line in the connection log which actually gives uh, the timestamp, the source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port, TCP flags, connection history, but then it also gives the source bytes and the destination bytes. So even though a shunting has happened, because the control packets are going in, at end of the day, you would actually see that this particular shunted SSH connection transferred two terabytes of uh, data and the connection log would actually show the exact byte count there. And the way Bro is able to do that is based on the TCP sequence and acknowledgement number. That's what Bro uses to estimate the byte transfers. So uh, you actually know the, what are bad or big connections if you are actually doing connection log analysis for forensic or post-examination. So this is how the entire diagram now looks. Uh, 7504 uh, gets all the data fed into it. It goes to 7150 uh, at 10 gig. Uh, level then it comes to all the bro cluster and then here is this orange feedback mechanism which actually is the shunt rule which actually says that okay uh, send me these bytes don't send me these bytes and then there are some uh, rules which actually are by default in the arista which are like okay uh, permit every fin every sin every reset and these are our control packets so they are always going to be there but then uh, deny everything else so now this is little getting into the weeds this is how a bro uh, component for shunting looks like so bro has this mechanism of uh, firing events so when bro sees a bulk connection then it actually fires this event called a bulk uh, event bulk connection detected it uh, sends this connection record in there and then th there is this little logic where okay if this by size, original size is greater than this, then you actually say shunt on origin or shunt on response based on like, okay, who is basically transferring big bytes? Is it the source or the destination? And this is uh, the, the second box in this uh, slide deck, which actually shows this info op add is how actually a shunt looks like. So it's the rule literally says TCP host 54183 and the source port is uh, uh, the port is equals to 80 and then the destination is this and the port is 47,000. If this is the uh, uh, rule, uh, you actually add uh, an ACL into Arista and then uh, any further bytes which are not control packets will not go to Bro. And then Bro also has this concept of connection expire because control packets are still going to Bro. Bro knows when this connection, TCP uh, connection expires and when that happens, Bro automatically fires another connect, uh, rule, which actually does that, okay, remove this particular ACL. So this way, there is always an ACL management on Arista. And then the third, the box at the bottom actually shows the Bro connection log. It says that, okay, here is the source uh, timestamp, January 30th, 4 a.m. in the morning. This is unique connection identifier, which is CA string random. Source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port. This is the protocol HTTP went for 280 seconds and these were the number of bytes which were transferred, which is 154,309. And then, so you know that these were the bytes transferred, but overall, uh, so this 154 megabytes, but we actually shunted it at somewhere around 128 megabytes. So, but here is how this shunting looks in the big picture. Uh, so uh, the blue uh, 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 spike here is actually the bytes going in Arista. And then uh, the green one is actually what gets filtered and the purple uh, color shows the output. So uh, like when there are high spikes happening, like when we plotted this diagram, uh, I think the spike went to about 12 GBPS. And then Bro identified it actually kicked in shunt and this entire uh, about 10 gbps -ish actually went away and then what bro would see is somewhere around 1 to 2 gbps and uh, like if you look at uh, like around 52 seconds to 57 seconds bro actually still sees like two and a half to three gbps spike and that is because 
the shunt kicked in and, and then bro actually when the traffic went down and the bottom diagram is literally the same thing which actually shows the same diagram but little more revealing that you know the bytes go in at about 10 to 12 gbps the red color shows the filtered bytes and the green color shows here what bro is seeing so this is the way we can actually run 100 gig lengths but bro would able to uh, still survive all the flood of the traffic coming in any questions or any comments am i going too fast everything looks good I mean, maybe I'll chime in here, Ashish, just to point out the irony, right? I mean, the irony here is that our goal was to build a system capable of monitoring 100 gig of traffic, and sort of accidentally along the way, we developed this technology called shunting that protects Bro from these huge spikes, and we end up actually, you know, with shunting, we don't even need to monitor this large volume of traffic, so it's it's... There, there's irony here in the, the discovery and implementation of the shunting feature. Yes, but uh, uh, to supplement that point, we can ignore the traffic because we confidently know that this traffic is uninteresting. So here is this another chart. This is back from 2015 uh, time frame, but these were the number of ACLs which were actually going on Arista. And this was one of the concerns too. Like, let's say we have very crazy grid FTP session going on or like sessions going on, then we don't want Arista to get overwhelmed with number of like uh, operations, uh, ACL operations like apply, 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 and then remove, remove. So we started measuring those two and there were times where we uh, Arista actually saw 100,000 operations which were either apply an ACL or remove an ACL and it was able to do it reasonably well. Uh, on an average day, uh, Arista actually has like a uh, number of active ACLs are in like two or three digit range, but uh, at any given moment of time, but uh, over the duration of the day, it can actually reach, uh, it can be variable from 10,000 to 100,000. So, so this is the way we actually deployed. We actually stood uh, Arista with tabs. We uh, connected all the like put existing connector connections to Arista then we actually had the new cluster this new cluster was running in parallel to our 10 gig infrastructure and uh, uh, we we were doing a very uh, much comparison as well like are we missing traffic are we seeing everything is it uh, correct and then I, I actually have something called an ICMP test so even in 100 gig length when we are doing sustained 10 gbps 20 gbps Let's send one single ICMP packet from my home machine and see if bro sees it. If bro sees it, I don't care about what it is dropping anymore. So we did all kinds of very thorough testing and then we actually started running two production cluster. And then, uh, uh, so we have a, a 100 gig cluster. Another one is a backup 100 gig cluster. And then we have a dev 100 gig cluster where we do all kinds of experimentation. So it has been production, average traffic it sees is two to five gigs. Uh, the last time I was looking at the spikes were going up to 27 gigs and then the shunting actually brings it back to our sustained level. So, so Ashish, we, ha we have two questions if you want to answer them right now. Yeah, or, sure. Okay, so the first is from uh, Jeffrey. Do you, do you do any scanning for malware inside of HTTP? You throw away payloads, uh, so he doesn't know if you could do that. Uh, actually... Uh, The big answer is no. Uh, by going to by the words of scanning for uh, malware in HTTP, because Bro does not have any specific signature for matching malware in HTTP. What Bro would do is that it would actually dump the HTTP session. So, like it looks at HTTP GET request and HTTP POST request, and then those gets actually dumped into a log file. Now we do have kind of. Uh, signatures like okay what could be a badness in http for example let's say somebody is running a nasty scan or doing an sql injection then we know bro knows that this is an sql injection and then bro would say that yeah this is bad we need to block this connection but let's say if somebody is transferring a, a disk image over http then bro would actually say yeah here is a wget on the file it would log that name of the file bro would say that this is a tar gz or it's something of, uh, or like it's a 500 GB uh, PDF file. So Bro would identify the MIME type, but then that is where Bro would stop. If it's an executable, 
bro would say it's an executable bro will not say if it's a bad executable or a good executable you have to figure that out i mean the other thing i'd add here is that we're shunting once the traffic is very big right the shunting kicks in at hundreds of megs here so it would have to be uh, hundreds of meg size malware before we wouldn't see the http um, right so keep in mind that what we're trying to do is is once it's hundreds of megs or gigs or we know it's going to go huge we start ignoring it but the first part of it we see every bit of the first part of it still okay uh the second question uh is from jim warner he wants to uh verify which specific model of arista 7500 you're using uh the 7504 the 4e or the 4r uh, he was told that the 504 is past the end of life that that is a good question and that is correct our 7504 is past end of life we actually have uh, have a project planning to replace that and you know i couldn't off the top of my head tell you what the new models that we ordered are but i think the summary of that is twofold is uh, you no longer need the two pieces anymore and there are models that sort of do everything that those two pieces do all in one, but I couldn't tell you the exact model. But yeah, don't buy a 7504. That's not what we're replacing with. Uh, maybe at the end, I'll give me a minute and I'll reply to that chat window with what the model is that we're about to replace the 7504 with. Okay. And then one last question uh, from uh, Jorge. How do you identify flows to be shunted, not forwarded to bro? What, what is your criteria for filtering? So one criteria is the number of bytes which are getting transferred. So if a HTTP goes over 128 megabyte, uh, shunting basically kicks in for that particular HTTP session. Uh, another heuristic is actually, sorry, for HTTP and SSH actually. And Bro has built in logic to actually identify that this is an HTTP session or this is an SSH session, irrespective of port. So you can run HTTP on one, two, three, four, five, and Bro would still be able to know that this is HTTP and would be able to shunt at 128 megs. Another logic uh, is a uh, another logic or a Bro policy is for identifying grid FTP traffic. So uh, where we actually said ta we taught Bro that these are the characteristics of grid FTP. If you see something like this, shunt at two megabytes. So, uh, and then we did a lot of measurements. Our big, uh, actually, byte consumers of the elephant flows were grid FTP, HTTP bytes, uh, HTTPS bytes, or uh, SSH. And this is where we uh, currently uh, stop, uh, like, uh, shunting uh, heuristics. So, shunting gets effect uh, effective only on these protocols. Okay. Those were all the active questions, so you can uh, continue. Okay, so uh, like previous slides were data from uh, uh, like uh, past, but uh, I so I said okay, I'm gonna just dump the stats from today morning. So this is at 10:42. So if you see like I I don't remember where the like what all aggregation is from like what is the beginning date, but the gigs in on the very first line is about uh, 12,425 terabytes of traffic which came in. And then about 7,000 terabytes went out. And then Bro shunted out about 5,000 terabytes of it. And this is aggregated from the last time we restarted Bro or we restarted shunting. But then uh, the lower lines show you uh, like uh, step by step like where it is going. So the second last line at 10.4201, you can see that input bytes were actually 12,000 uh, GB uh, gigabit. And then the output was about 2,000. And then Bro shunted out 10,000 gigabit. So this is how shunting actually kicks in. And this is how uh, we can manage to keep everything under like uh, between like 2 to 5 gigabit. So this is basically real time how it looks like uh, when the system is working. So uh, apart from this, like, OK, so is the cluster operational? So we said, OK, let's figure out. Let's do all the measurements. So we started doing measurements on. Uh, all the traffic coming in and like this graph is like you cannot really see shades but there like uh, there is actually spikes going up to 24 gigabit but the vast majority of spikes are around like 5 to 10 gigabit or 10 to 15 gigabit but then you can see the uh, density of the traffic is somewhere around like 2 to 3 4 gigabit range so then we actually said okay let's do measurement on each particular worker so each physical box, so basically the traffic seen by Mericoms. And you can see that, okay, the traffic now is going only till 
10 Gbps, but then uh, like each one of the, like each Maricom C is really less than uh, one gigabit. But there are a lot of spikes and this is where Bro can handle the spikes or uh, we like uh, Bro can figure out like this is where we need to start shunting. So these were five critical boxes. Then we actually did CPU measurements as well where we are like okay how is manager doing in terms of cpu so on average we would do like manager would see about less than 20 percent cpu but then there, there would be very periodic spikes and this is i think how manager is doing uh, cluster uh, management so this, like there are periodic spikes but then each worker uh, i said okay let's start measuring individual workers and like what cpu each worker is consuming so the data gets pretty dense and nasty but the good part here was that Apart from little few spikes, everything was under 20% CPU range. So this was actually uh, uh, the assurance that, you know, we can see all the traffic, we can count stuff, and uh, we are still not overwhelming bro. So we had some very interesting problems which we encountered. So I think Vince can explain this one uh, uh, in great details, but what happened is that we once everything was running great, we actually said, okay, let's upgrade to the latest, greatest Arista. And then we started seeing problems where like uh, bro would see only half connection and then bro would go crazy. So for example, Jay sends me an email. Uh, so bro sees that there is an email in connection log, but we, uh, bro would not see any content of that email. And what was happening was that their latest and greatest firmware actually had a bug in a symmet uh, like symmetric hashing algorithm. So this became very tricky to debug because we are like problem is in bro or problem is in Maricom or problem is in Arista. So we, and it was getting like, it was very unpredictable because of the bug would kick in for some connections, but not all connections. So we literally ran TCP dump on multiple interfaces and we started watching. We started going through each one of them. We told it to Arista and Arista could not reproduce the problem. And they would not actually buy that there is a bug in the firmware. So we had to literally get them on our dev cluster, do a screen share, show them the bug. And then they were like, oh yeah, there is this problem with like symmetric hashing. But this, this actually uh, like derailed uh, uh, the entire deployment by at least two weeks because this became a very subtle problem which were, was very difficult to understand. Then there were uh, Maricom issues uh, with uh, Bro and the Git master, we were running the latest, greatest Maricom drivers, latest, greatest Bro development. And then there were all of a sudden high CPUs. Maricom would freeze when we run Bro control restart. And then everything would work fine, but then it would freeze. So there is like, uh, Maricom is a problem. So we had to figure those out. We had to figure out problems on manager with high CPU. Then uh, there were time when Dumnos would not apply ACLs to Arista. So there were all these little, little issues which we actually kept fixing up across the uh, time of the deployment and uh, dev things. But at end of the day, like I think the goal was 1st January 2015, we should have a deployed like a production cluster good enough for high quality of forensic data and everything has to be done right. And we were able to get that to that deadline. And then there is this, uh, uh, our entire experience got written in this document, which is on go.lbn.gov slash 100 gig. We had about 2000 plus downloads. There were 31 unique government and military institutions, which actually did the download, uh, 100, 100 plus unique EDU. I, I don't remember uh, when is this numbers from, but I don't think these are the very latest numbers. But then there were DOE awards and stuff, but I think the greatest award we got was that one of the EDU peers actually said that this is an amazing document. They did pretty much everything except build it for you. And that is what actually our intention was with the 100 gig uh, writer. Like people should be able to take that and then deploy it on their side. So if you have any other questions, anything, or if you are actually even thinking of doing a deployment on your end, and if you want, uh, uh, to ping, feel free to do that anytime. Uh, we would be more than happy to talk about this stuff. All right. Well, thank you, guys. Uh, we don't have any questions coming in right now, but we'll give some uh, time for people who are who want to type them in. Uh, I had written down a bunch of them, but you actually answered most of them. So at this point, I don't think I have any. Um, I, I guess I, I do have maybe maybe one question. I don't know if you can answer this or not, but you know. 
what was sort of the most interesting thing that uh, a bro sort of stopped from happening within your infrastructure? Do you have any good war stories of, you know, a virus or a worm that was spreading that that bro was able to sort of detect or, or anything, anything along those nature? Uh, how much time do we have? Well, you know, we're at the end of the hour, but people who want to stay can certainly stay. I, I can stay a little bit longer. Okay. So I mean, we, have, we have hundreds of war stories. Yeah. There's a lot of interesting stories. Like I think uh, uh, one was like when uh, Morto worm came up, uh, what bro did was like bro would see that, you know, we would find some badness and then we would block it. So on, I think it was June 23rd of 2014 or yeah, 2014. Uh, and then like in the morning when I woke up, there were 100,000 ACLs. And, uh, and it's like, okay, what's going on? Things don't look right. 3389 connections are happening. What's going on? And then it's, so we started analyzing it from bro connection data. And uh, a month later, uh, whatever we were seeing actually got called out as Morto. And then same thing happened. Uh, where we started like uh, similar stuff was where these uh, uh, camera uh, worm like ca uh, all these different uh, cameras and webcams and DVRs on internet started like scanning us and then uh, we are like okay what's going on bro is con constantly blocking all this traffic and then that turns out to be what's now Mirai botnet and uh, 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 another similar story uh, where uh, like uh, bad guys would actually log in to a system. They would compromise, like they would do simple stuff like brute force SSH, the account is user, user or test, test. And then they would actually download uh, some uh, rootkit and then bro would actually see that rootkit, log it. Uh, and then the, we would know that, yeah, this was the rootkit. This is where the IRC server they actually connected to. And these were the botnet commands. So you can actually sometimes see in the IRC sessions where the bad guys is like, oh, I got, uh, uh, to a dot gov and then all of a sudden damn it they caught me so you can actually see those things in these IRC logs or different sessions which gets done by bro uh, so there is almost always like every uh, few weeks you would always see something uh, where there is an instance and oh, oh one was the Bitcoin miners which actually were compromising these different machines and running Bitcoin uh, software and then they would actually go get to different printers and then uh, bro would see that, yeah, this is a printer. This is a Bitcoin miner. They are trying to do an FTP upload to the printer and then would actually kick in a block for that. Wow. Great, great stuff. Well, yeah, uh, moving, actually. So. <laughs> uh, okay. So we just had one come in. Uh, are you doing any passive analysis of the logs? Are you able to detect threats, adverse behavior patterns from the logs? Yes, that is something we constantly do. One of the thing is if we have an incident, we would always go back to our logs to see uh, what story log has tell. But then we actually, like because we have data from 1994 onwards, uh, we use uh, that, uh, like uh, if there is something happening, we would actually, we can go back like 30 days, 60 days, one year search. There have been times when we actually ended up doing like two or three year searches too. And the instances are, here are two examples. One was where we actually had a compromise, which ended up where bad guys and, and uh, were compromised the machine initially about two years ago. And, uh, but they were not coming uh, back to the system, uh, only coming back like every few months, every like three or four months would log in and then log out. So we actually went and searched data and then figured it out. But then there are other times when we have to do passive analysis and that's for generating, like when we come up with new heuristics, for example, the latest one I am thinking of is asymmetric HTTPS. So we would have come up with a new heuristic line, then we would go back to historic logs. We will uh, run our heuristics on the logs and see if that is making sense, what kind of false positives or things we are catching. And then we would deploy that as a policy. And the third part where we would do passive analysis is intelligence feeds. We get the data, uh, like even if we get a list of IPs today, we would run that uh, through our past data to see if uh, something bad happened, which we did not catch before. So they, this, this, this feedback loop is always going on where we, like I think the one of the quests we run is like, can we search 10 years of logs within five seconds? If we can search faster, we will search more. 
Okay. So I, I have a, a bit of a follow on from that one. Uh, do you make any of the logs uh, with redacted information available for security researchers so that they can help um, sort of develop new heuristics or no? Jay, you want to answer this one? I mean, the answer to that is we definitely do. Um, I mean, Ashish is being a little uh, shy here, but uh, we continue to work very closely with Vern Paxson and what I would describe as his his group of researchers. Um, we do have, a, I mean, uh, for some things, we will release logs to them, even non-anonymized. We have a process that we go through where, you know, we uh, approve the release of logs to them after we hear exactly what they're trying to do, how they'll keep them secure, how they'll keep them anonymized. Um, I think the latest product of that is um, uh, Ashish and company, Vern, just released a Usenix paper on new methods to detect targeted phishing attacks with Bro. And that research was based upon us giving, uh, you know, Bro SMTP email logs to the research community, i.e. Ashish, Vern, and company to do that sort of research with. But we do, I mean, part of that is that we continue to protect privacy in those logs as tight as possible, right? So usually the researchers we do this sort of stuff with are close partners. The data doesn't leave our machine. They multi-factor in. We have the ability to sort of review product that they produce to assure it's anonymized to the right level. But I think we, we not only do that sort of research, we consider that a critical part of our operations uh, because I think the research community, that's one of the challenges they face is it's hard to progress forward if nobody will share real world data with you to progress forward on. Uh, the benefit from that we get from that is we get cutting edge research implemented at the laboratory, right? So uh, Ashish and Vern and companies uh, targeted phishing email detection stuff is running at the lab right now. All right. Well, I think that that's, that's awesome. As long as we can, you know, continue to, to make this stuff better since the attacks are only going to get more sophisticated. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions. Uh, so I want to thank you guys again. Uh, I think that this was great uh, hearing about this and people most certainly will have questions as they, uh, they take a look at the, the 100 gig document as they try to implement this on their campuses. Uh, and thanks again for everybody sticking around. Next week's talk will be from uh, Jim Warner at UCSC and he hasn't told me what he's going to talk about yet, but I'm sure it's going to be uh, related to performance. Um, so thanks again, everybody, and I'll post the recording and we'll talk to everybody next week. Thanks everyone.